Hi everyone, this is Professor M. Das Science, and today I want to discuss Hermitian operators. This is another one of our videos on rigorous quantum mechanics. Hermitian operators are the most important type of operator in quantum mechanics because they allow us to describe physical observables. Today we will learn two things. First, that the eigenvalues of Hermitian operators are real numbers. This is important because physical quantities are typically described by real numbers. Second, that the eigenstate of a Hermitian operator form a basis in state space. This is important because in order to predict the outcome of a measurement in quantum mechanics, we first need to represent the state we're measuring in the basis of the eigenstates of the operator. Let's go! A Hermitian operator A is an operator that is equal to its adjoint. Remember from the video on operators that if an operator A acts on a ket psi to give another ket psi prime, then in the Joule space, the adjoint operator A dagger is the operator that acts on the bra psi and gives the bra psi prime. An immediate implication of A being Hermitian is that we can rewrite this last expression as the operator A acting on the bra psi and then giving the bra psi prime. What I want to do in the rest of the video is to study two important features of Hermitian operators. The first is that the eigenvalues of a Hermitian operator are real numbers. This is in fact reassuring because Hermitian operators are the operators representing physical observables in quantum mechanics, and physical observables tend to be characterized by real numbers. The second property is that the eigenstate of a Hermitian operator can be chosen to form an orthonormal set, and that this set forms a basis in state space. What this means is that we can always write an arbitrary quantum state in the representation given by the eigenstates of a physical observable. And we will see that this property becomes key when discussing measurements in quantum mechanics. Let's start with eigenvalues. The eigenvalue equation is a psi equals lambda psi, where the lambda is the eigenvalue and psi the eigenstate. What we do first is to act from the right on both sides of this equation with the bra psi to obtain this. The next thing I want to do is to rewrite the eigenvalue equation in the Joule space. Remember that an operator becomes the adjoint operator A dagger, and the scalar becomes the complex conjugate lambda star. This is a general expression for any operator A. If we now insist that our operator is a Hermitian operator, then we can replace A dagger by A. The final step is to act with the ket psi from the right, and we get this. The left-hand sides of these two equations, here and here, are the same, so the right-hand sides must also be the same. Equating them leads to this equation here. Remember that the scalar product of a ket with itself is a positive number, and it is only zero for the trivial case of the null vector psi equals zero. This means that in general this bracket will not be zero, so that lambda star must equal lambda for this equation to hold. This in turn implies that lambda is a real number. Therefore, the eigenvalues of a Hermitian operator are real numbers. Let's now move to eigenstates. We consider a first eigenstate psi with eigenvalue lambda, and the second eigenstate phi with eigenvalue mu. The first scenario we look at is when lambda and mu are different eigenvalues. The first step is to operate with the bra phi on the first equation to get this. For the second equation, we start by transforming it to the dual space. And remember that A is Hermitian, so we don't need the dagger, and mu is real as we just proved, so we don't need the complex conjugate either. Then we operate with the ket psi to get this. The left-hand sides of these two equations are the same, so we can equate the right-hand sides to obtain this. Because for now we're working with lambda different from mu, then this can only be true if the bracket between phi and psi is zero. Therefore, the eigenstate of a Hermitian operator corresponding to different eigenvalues are orthogonal. What this means is that if all our eigenvalues are different, then all eigenstates are mutually orthogonal. So we can normalize them and form an orthonormal basis of our state space. What we will see in the rest of the video is that this is true even if lambda and mu are the same. But in this case the situation is a little more subtle, because we can no longer conclude that phi and psi are orthogonal. So what we want to do next is to see what happens to eigenstates when we have degenerate eigenvalues. First, let's remember some of the properties of degenerate eigenvalues. 
the eigenvalue equation for an n-fold degenerate eigenvalue becomes a psi i equals lambda psi i, where i runs from 1 to n and labels the n eigenstates that share the same eigenvalue lambda. We showed in the video on eigenvalues that you can make any linear combination of these eigenstates to form a new ket phi, and that this new ket is also an eigenstate of a with the same eigenvalue lambda. What this means is that for an n-fold degenerate eigenvalue, then any ket that lives in the n-dimensional subspace of state space spanned by the set of eigenkets psi i is also a valid eigenstate. This first property is true for any operator, be it Hermitian or not. The second important point to remember is that for an n-fold degenerate eigenvalue of a Hermitian operator, there are n linearly independent eigenstates. In turn, what this means is that for an n-dimensional state space, there are n linearly independent eigenstates. Of these eigenstates, those belonging to different eigenvalues are orthogonal, as we proved in the previous slide, but all we can say about those belonging to degenerate eigenvalues is that they are linearly independent, but may not be mutually orthogonal. What I want to show next is how we can make all these states mutually orthogonal to get an orthonormal basis for state space. We know that any linear combination of the eigenstate of an n-fold degenerate subspace gives another ket that is also an eigenstate with the same eigenvalue. This property means that we can always build a new set of mutually orthogonal eigenstates in this subspace by making linear combinations of them. The process is pretty straightforward and is called Gram-Schmidt orthonormalization. This works in exactly the same way for any set of linearly independent vectors in any vector space, so you may already have encountered it in other areas. What I will do here is to sketch how it works and you can fill in the gaps yourself. I will call the original set of linearly independent but not necessarily orthogonal states psi i, and the new set that we want to build, phi i. And what we want is that the phi i are mutually orthonormal. The first step is to pick phi 1 as proportional to psi 1. The proportionality constant is to make sure that the state is normalized. The second step is to build a state that is perpendicular to phi 1. To do that, we define a ket chi 2, which we set equal to psi 2 plus some multiple of the first state phi 1. What we want is that chi 2 is orthogonal to phi 1, so we insist that this bracket here is 0. Plugging in the expression for chi 2, we get this. We can now see that this term will vanish if we choose alpha to be equal to minus phi 1 psi 2. Replacing this expression above, we obtain how to build chi 2 in terms of psi 2 and phi 1, while ensuring it is orthogonal to phi 1. We then define phi 2 to be parallel to chi 2, but choose it to be normalized. So does this recipe make sense? It is easy to understand what we're doing here by analogy to a two-dimensional Euclidean space. Let's imagine we have two linearly independent vectors that are not necessarily orthogonal, v1 and v2. We pick v1 as a reference, and then we want to make a new state from v2 that is orthogonal to v1. To start, v2 has a component parallel to v1, which I draw in green and is given by v2 dot v1 hat in the v1 direction, where v1 hat is the unit vector in the v1 direction, and then it has a second component, which here I call w2. This w2 vector is perpendicular to v1, so this is the new vector that I am looking for. Therefore all I need to do is to make it proportional to v2, and then subtract the component of v2 along v1. In this analogy, w2 is equivalent to chi2, the original vector v2 is equivalent to the original ket psi2, and the part that we remove parallel to v2 is equivalent to the part that we remove here parallel to phi1. For an n-dimensional subspace, all we need to do to construct the rest of eigenstates to make a mutually orthonormal set is to repeat the same procedure. The end result is a new set of eigenstates phi i, which form an orthonormal basis in the n-dimensional subspace, and putting all subspaces together we get a basis for the entire state space. The last thing I want to do is to investigate what Hermitian operators look like in the matrix formulation of quantum mechanics. As you can probably guess, they are written down in terms of Hermitian matrices. To see this, remember that the adjoint of an operator is given by the transpose conjugate matrix. In terms of matrix elements, if an operator A has matrix elements Aij, then the matrix elements of the adjoint operator A dagger are Aji star. For a Hermitian operator, A and A dagger are the same, so Aij is equal to Aji star. So what does this matrix look like? 
Let's start by writing the matrix representing the Hermitian operator A. What we want to investigate is whether we can say anything more specific about what the elements of this matrix look like when the matrix is Hermitian. To do that, we first consider the diagonal elements of the matrix, and for these elements we have that i equals j, so that aii equals aii star, which in turn implies that aii is a real number. What about the off-diagonal entries? In this case, all we can say is that aij is equal to aji star. For example, the a12 element here must be the complex conjugate of the a21 element here. This means that the matrix of a Hermitian operator A first has diagonal elements which are real numbers, shown in green here, and then there is some relation between the entries on either side of the diagonal. If this is entry A12, then this entry here is A12 star. The same happens for A13 and this entry here, and so on. What we just found about how to write down a Hermitian operator in the matrix formulation of quantum theory is true irrespective of the state space basis in which we write the operator. However, we have found earlier in the video that the eigenstate of a Hermitian operator can be chosen themselves to form a basis. So a natural question that arises is whether there is anything special about the basis formed by the eigenstate of a given operator. The answer to this question has tremendous importance in quantum mechanics, and features prominently in what happens when you measure the physical property associated with the operator. You can learn more about this by following the link in the description below, but all I want to do here is to show what the matrix associated with A looks like when we write it in the basis of eigenstates of A. Let's start by writing the eigenvalue equation for A, and I will pick the eigenstates phi n to be orthonormal. So what does the operator A look like in the phi basis? Its matrix elements are given by this expression. We can then use the eigenvalue equation to determine the action of A on phi n, and plugging this back in gives this. Then, using the orthonormality relation here, we obtain lambda m delta nm. What this means is that the matrix elements vanish unless n equals m, which means that the matrix is diagonal. Furthermore, the diagonal entries are simply the eigenvalues of the operator A. So let's write down the matrix. Remember that we found that the matrix associated with the Hermitian operator had real entries in the diagonal. This is clearly true here, as the eigenvalues of a Hermitian operator are real numbers. Remember also that the off-diagonal elements were complex conjugates of each other, and this is again true here in a trivial manner as all these entries are zero. Putting this together, the matrix associated with an operator A is diagonal when written in the basis spanned by the eigenstates of the operator, and the diagonal entries are simply the eigenvalues of the operator. Before we wrap up, let me emphasize that this result is something that we will encounter time and again in quantum mechanics, so make sure you're comfortable with it. So what have we learned about Hermitian operators? These operators have two properties which are essential when we study quantum mechanics. The first one is that their eigenvalues are real numbers, and the second, that their eigenstates form a basis in state space. Both of these properties become fundamental when we study measurements in quantum mechanics. If you want to see how this comes about, check out the videos on measurements. If you liked the video or you'd like to send me suggestions for future videos, please subscribe.